Yeah, about 77. Uh, that was when it, the rail went out of here, but uh, it was a year or two before that it was closed down. My name is Bill Dalton, I'm a rancher and trucker down here at Estra, Alberta. Well, this town was just born in 26, and um, it, um, it didn't flourish very, very much for very long, and then it finally, it never was a big town. Oh, it was only 30, 40 people at the high, but um, it served a big area. We had stores and bulk fuel and school and, and all that, you know. I'm a writer with a camera. Hi, my name is Chris Doring and I'm a historic journalist. What brought us here? Brought uh, besides a car, right? <laughs> uh, interest in vanishing history. Uh, uh, so that people can get an understanding of what we're losing. How they were bustling, interesting, busy places at one time and now, well, more pigeons than there is people. In some cases, no people whatsoever. So just the, 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 the contrast of that. Whether the message is getting across, I don't know if we're getting the message across or not, um, but I, I certainly hope they do. Or somebody, at least one. At least one. If we've done it for one, then, then at least we've connected with somebody. It's a nice house. I think I'm going to pass on trying to set up out here in this wind right now. My name's Rob Paul, and I'm a fine art photographer working with film. Well, today we're in this little ghost town. I guess the lady we were just talking to says there's still 10 people left here, so it's not quite a ghost town, but uh, Hoosier, Saskatchewan. And I have to give it three stops of extra exposure to compensate for the filter. Yeah, I mean, it's an old process. You know, film photography started over 150 years ago, and I like taking pictures of stuff that's old and and falling down. Just don't lift your leg on it. I appreciate sort of the historic value in things. Uh, I'm not a researcher to the extent that Chris and our friends are, but uh, already make a minor adjustment. Visually, I like to document that kind of stuff. I have a huge interest in, you know, how Canada and North America came to be and how it was settled and developed and how it's changing and evolving and that's part of what I try to document on film. So. Okay, so we're now gonna. I think that dog's probably in the shot too, and he just got comfortable. There we go. I suppose anyone that's gonna view this project is gonna see that it's a slow process to set up this camera. Hey, sh go on. Come here. Come here. Although these are modern cameras that were made, you know, in the last 20 years or less. They're still based on this exact same principles and the old systems that were in use back to the turn of the last century. 
And those old guys, you know, their film and materials would have been a little bit different and their exposures longer and details like that. But the, the function of the camera was the same. You can't operate that camera with big mittens and gloves on. You can dress yourself as warm as you want to, but you pretty much have to do it with bare hands. It's a 10 to 15 minute operation. with bare hands and trying to warm them in your pocket and keep your fingers from freezing. And nowadays we've got technology and, you know, thin slate gloves and hand warmers and all the stuff that we have at our disposal to try to make it a little bit easier. We have vehicles that we can drive right up close to where we're working, but these guys would have probably gone out, you know, horse and buggy, something like that, to drive out to where they wanted to do some of that shooting. And, you know, I don't think they did it every day, and I don't think they took hundreds of images every year, but um, that certainly is admirable for them to have the perseverance and the en endurance to be able to go out and do that, for sure. <laughs> As I say, there's no such thing as bad weather, just bad clothes. My name is Connie Biggert and I'm the creative team in, in Big Door. About the work that we do, it's important, I think. And it's important we keep the past because the past sort of helps us make what we were and what we are is our past. It sort of makes a person who we are and, and how it makes the city who we are, the town who they are. Is, is the past and what happened and what people did to build this town and, and to, to grow up their families and teach their kids. And the, the values of your area, every, every kind of area has its own little kind of set of values and its own history and what it made it, it what it was. And I don't generally do a whole lot of research before I visit something because I generally discover stuff that if I did the research first, it's just, it's just a natural progression. So uh, get, a, get a visual of it, get a feeling for it, and then, then dig. Find what the subject means, what, uh, what's out there. We go searching, you know, we track down what we can on it and, and we start putting together a story. It always, it doesn't, it never goes together in a, in a linear form. It always, sometimes the, the, the second half of the story is complete before the first half is ever created. Um, but each case is unique, so it, it, it sometimes goes together in a very chaotic form and then at the very end, it becomes orderly. And Rodney had a fire in here and burned all my school books and everything else, so the whole thing would have burnt down. How many people lived in this house? Well, as many as you could get in. <laughs> yeah, you just made a, you know, you nailed a, a bed out and then put some straw in it and that's how you slept in it. Wow. Yeah, I slept in there in the summertime when my sisters were at home here and everything. How many sisters did you have? I got three, Mary, Kay and Anne. And they're all passed away, my mother, my dad passed away first, he passed away, he was 67, I think, very young. But he, I worked on his land all the time, and, and when, then my sisters went away, and I just stayed here until he died. And I had, I went and started, I said, Dad, I'm going to buy my own land. And who owns this now? Uh, McCary has this here now. Yeah, the train was running, that's true. They built the, they built the railroad, they surveyed the railroad in 1914, from Crawford to Coronation. And then in uh, 1915, the first train went through here. I don't know where they hooked the train together, like the, the rails. But, uh, and it comes down from Fuselier, and then it's just three quarters of a mile from where I was born. 
me on this. Then this uh, here's where I slept, and then the Kapitskys and and uh, John Lowers and what uh, else? South of our places, Whittleton's, Dormans, Blyes. John Lauer, he lived over here, and uh, where those big hills are. He ran, he had a steel wheel uh, tractor and, and no brakes on it. And the kid come, his kid come running to meet him out of the field, and there was a hill, and he couldn't stop the tractor and run right over him. They killed him. What prompted you to buy the elevator? Well, I farmed just on the, on the east, northeast of uh, Fuselier, just across the road where the rodeo grounds are. We had a rodeo there for 18, no, 16 years. The rodeo is still there, but all the cowboys and cowgirls are dead. My name's Byron Robb, and I'm a fan. We are in the abandoned town of Fusilier, Saskatchewan, in an old grain elevator. Beautiful place. Well, first and foremost, I love photography and the opportunity to come out and uh, shoot places that I didn't even know existed and to be with, uh, with friends that know their way around. That, that draws me out here. And the weather, somewhat disappointing, but hey, this, this is a day when I'm Canadian first. You know. Canadians can do this. What's your subject now, Rob? I'm looking up at that shoe and the light spilling through the cracks and all the textures. I'm going to go with the long version of the story. I ran across uh, BigDoer.com, Chris and Connie, on Facebook, and I started reading their stuff, and it, it really quite fascinated me. So I wrote to Chris and said, I, uh, I have become a fan. And a little while later I said, uh, why don't we go out for coffee? He couldn't make it during the day, so it ended up being evening and beers, and uh, we've become friends since then. We've stayed in touch, and he's invited me along on a couple of things, this one being the, uh, the biggest adventure so far. If some of those older guys, probably women too, but it was mostly men photographers back in those days, if they didn't have the foresight to take those kind of images, that history would be lost. I don't think in modern times it's quite the same thing. Everyone has a camera on their cell phone and digital cameras are everywhere and there's billions of pictures taken every day. But, you know, a snapshot and something taken with a little bit more thought and composition is not quite the same things. I like those style of bridges. Did you go to the church yet? No. no. What time do you have to hit the road, Chris? A lot of times I will go back to the same place and shoot it again and again and again because I'm getting it at a different time of year with different lighting conditions, uh, you know, seasonal changes with snow and leaves and grass or whatever the case may be. And I often will go back to a place half a dozen or more times and shoot a slightly different perspective, sometimes the same angle and every once in a while you go back to one and you get there and it's gone. Mm -hmm. 
I have an archive of probably about 6,000 negatives, visual records of things that no longer exist. And it used to bother me a lot to go back and you'd find something and, oh, it's gone. You kind of have to come to accept it because it's inevitable, but it's still sad, you know, to see it, especially some of the more historically interesting and valuable things. always be nice to have it preserved, but uh, things such as our elevator and stuff, it just falls on deaf ears through the bureaucracy of the government and everything else. And now with the um, population dwindling all the time, it's just so hard to get anybody interested in it. A plug-in, you know, I'm the worst, my worst self-promoter ever. I don't even know what to say. Uh, I, I, I wish people would just come and experience what we experience. Bigdoor.com. It's B-I-G-D-O-E-R. That's a combination of, of Connie and Mai's last name, Biggert and Doring. Well, they can expect to find something written about this very building we're in at some point. Uh, they can expect to see our hiking adventures. They can expect to see all the old machinery we document. They can expect to see those interesting then and nows that we discussed uh, where, we, where we try and duplicate a scene and, uh, and see what it looks like from then today to today. Uh, they can find all that kind of stuff. So. And, and you have some fans in Byron here. Well, I got, <laughs> it feels good to know at least there's somebody. <laughs> It, it's, it's all over the map. Getting access to Esther, for example, was, was easy. Getting access here was a little more work. It's important that we make sure that they know we're doing it. A lot of people don't bother. A lot of people think if it's abandoned, it's wide open for access. That's a dangerous mindset. You certainly wouldn't want someone you know, rooting through your garage. Same applies to these old buildings.